It was a near-perfect spring day as 50-year-old Jennifer Dulos loaded her children into the family's 2017 Chevy Suburban and took them to school. She rushed right back home because she had two doctor's appointments in New York City, one at 11 a.m. and the second at 1 p.m. Depending on traffic, she should have plenty of time to get home, gather her stuff, change cars, and head out. She made it home, but that's where her trail ends. From there, Jennifer Dulos, mother of five, going through the extended trials and tribulations of a messy divorce, just disappeared. Before we begin, we would like to extend our deepest sympathies to the family and loved ones of Jennifer Dulos, a loving mother of five and a devoted daughter who was taken from those who needed her very much. She would never show up at the doctor's office, and when her nanny arrived at the house with the kids in tow, there would be no sign of Jennifer. The Chevy Suburban was not in the garage, and the 2014 Range Rover that Jennifer had planned to drive to the city was still there. A personal friend of hers arrived at the home just minutes later, and the two adults quickly called the police to let them know she was missing. Police were on the scene by 7 p.m. that evening. Jennifer was rarely late and hadn't messaged anyone about any delays. She was not answering calls. They knew they had a good reason to worry for Jennifer's safety, as they were familiar with how contentious the divorce had been going and how violent her former husband, Fotis Dulos, was supposed to be. Let's take a moment to look at the marriage and divorce of Jennifer and Fotis Dulos. Fotis Dulos was a Greek man who emigrated to the United States in 1986. He would graduate from Brown University, a private Ivy League school, and go on to receive a master's degree in business administration and finance from Columbia University. He married in 2000 and then divorced in 2004. The same year, he founded a real estate development and construction company, The Four Group Incorporated, that concentrated on high-end homes and other projects. Jennifer Farber, a 1990 graduate of Brown University herself, would go on to earn a master's degree in writing from the New York University School of the Arts. Jennifer came from a well-to-do and well-connected family, her aunt and uncle having founded the Liz Claiborne Incorporated Fashion Company. The two would meet at Brown University alumni events and eventually fell in love. Fotis, however, was still involved with his first marriage. The two would marry just one month after the divorce from his first wife was finalized. Jennifer and Fotis would make their home in one of the more posh neighborhoods of Farmington, Connecticut. They would have five children, three sons and two daughters, including two sets of twins. Fotis's business would flourish and the family would be very busy with outdoor activities, particularly water skiing. By 2012, Jennifer would begin telling friends that the marriage had troubles and after a vacation in 2017, it seemed that Fotis had decided to give infidelity another try, this time with Michelle Traconis, a somewhat younger woman originally from Venezuela. Jennifer had been down this road before at the beginning of her own relationship with Fotis. In court papers and recollections from friends, she said that she began moving things out of the family home and preparing to leave the cheating man. Everything was kept secret, especially her knowledge of the affair, for as long as possible to keep him from getting suspicious. Over the years, she would claim, Fotis had become more controlling and threats of violence were becoming less and less uncommon when she would have arguments with him. Finally, one day, she packed up the kids and filed for divorce. She would end up renting a home in nearby New Canaan, Connecticut, and began the slow, long slog through the courts to dissolve the marriage and their sizable shared wealth. The custody battle between the two for the five children would become extremely contentious, with supervised visitations being required as Fotis became more demanding. The loss of his children was turning anger into hate. Did it turn into something murderous as well? Now that we've looked at the environment that had developed between Jennifer and Fotis Dulos, let's return to her apparent disappearance on May the 24th of 2019. 
Officers entered the home of Jennifer Dulos in an effort to see if she was somewhere within the house or to find any clues as to her whereabouts. The officers, led by New Canaan Police Department officer Thomas Patton, entered the 6,000-square-foot, six-bedroom, nine-bath home on the ground floor, through the garage, and into the family's kitchen area. Searching throughout the first floor, nothing seemed out of place. There were no signs of any kind of a struggle. On the second floor, they found much the same situation. The family's bedrooms and belongings appeared to have not been affected, and there was still no sign of Jennifer. The unfurnished basement also turned up nothing as they searched. Returning to the kitchen area, the officers noticed a large handbag on the floor between the door, the garage, and the kitchen counter, like it had just been dropped off as someone came in. Within were papers and one of Jennifer's jackets. <laughs> All right, I've located that vehicle. It is parked on the side of the road on Lapham approaching Talmadge. I have a secondary plate for you to run when you're ready. Connecticut. Perhaps she had brought it in when coming to change vehicles before heading off to New York City and her appointments. But she hadn't changed cars. The Range Rover was still in the garage and the Suburban was still gone. The police officers went back out to the garage and looked around a bit more closely. His wife did something. But drive first. Dry edges, let's have it. Yeah, well he just called in. He had a lot of stuff. Huh? There's some back here too. Is there? Yeah, down here too. And it looks like it's been buffed or scraped or scrapped all down through the ground side. Well, it's a strange in connection with the fact that we've got a missing person, a potential missing person. Yeah. Yeah, there's scrapes on this side too, but there's no blood near them, so whatever they hit went down this side of the vehicle. Especially because, like, it's like a pattern here. You know what I mean? It's clothing. Right, not fur. But there, it's, I mean, it's up here too. It's hard to get any of this. This camera here. We should get better cameras. Hopefully this is getting it though. Right? Usually if you hit a deer and there's blood in your car, you take it to the car wash and get it cleaned. Especially a Range Rover. Let's see if there's any damage in it. 
I mean, this is grandma's house. You never know. But. As they photograph what could be potential evidence, other officers are in the area looking out for the missing Suburban in hopes of finding Jennifer. At this point, they are pursuing this as a missing persons case, but their questions about blood found on the Range Rover would eventually become very important. Forensic teams would take samples of the blood found on the vehicle and further find some small flecks of blood on the kitchen faucet. Over the following hours, forensic team members would identify numerous tiny specks and spatters of blood. Traces were found on the Range Rover's hood, bumper, tire, and rear fender. More blood specks were found on the door leading from the garage into the mudroom on the door's interior knob and plate. In the kitchen, beyond the specks that were found on the faucet, there were additional ones found inside the under-sink cabinet door. More tiny blood specks were found on the garage door and inside of the garage's east wall. All of these samples were sent off for DNA testing. If they were shown to be human and Jennifer's, the tiny amounts found and the otherwise spotless nature of the area would mean that someone may well have cleaned up a crime scene, thoroughly but not completely. An hour after police began investigating the blood found on the Range Rover, Jennifer's Suburban was found abandoned at Waveney Park, some three and a half miles away. There was no sign of Jennifer. There was a real possibility that something very bad had happened to the 50-year-old woman. It would not take long before detectives turned their attention to Jennifer's ex-husband, Fotis, who lived about an hour and a half away in Farmington, Connecticut. Fotis was asked to come to the police station and did so on May the 25th, 2019 at 2.47 p.m., where he was met by Officer Patton of the New Canaan Police Department and Connecticut State Police Detective Christopher Allegro. According to the men, Fotis asked the two men if there had been any information about Jennifer's disappearance and was informed that they were seeking help in the investigation. Initially, Fotis seemed willing to help, but his attorney quickly shut down any chance of an interview with him. When asked to see his telephone, Fotis initially agreed again, but then it was taken back by his attorney on his advice and required the investigators to obtain a warrant before they seized or examined it. The investigators had to wait until about 8.50 p.m. that night before the warrant was given. They then retrieved the phone from Fotis, as well as a second one he owned. What investigators would learn from Fotis's telephone would begin painting a picture of a horrible crime. Investigators found that on the day of Jennifer's disappearance, Fotis's phone pinged off of locations going to and from a job site earlier that day and then spent the vast majority of the day at his home at Jefferson Crossing in Farmington, Connecticut, an hour and a half away from Jennifer's last known location. The information alone would seem to put him out of question as being involved in her disappearance, except that it then showed that evening he went out and traveled to Hartford, Connecticut, some 15 minutes away from his home. Once again, nothing particularly unusual in that, except that the cell tower pings seem to point out that he stopped at some 30 or more locations in and around town in a very apparently random pattern. It was suspicious enough, considering his relationship with Jennifer, that investigators began canvassing the area and obtaining surveillance camera footage from the locations and times matching those stops from his phone history. It showed Fotis and Michelle Traconis going about town, pulling over and dropping bags of trash here and there. Many, many bags of trash. It seems that he would go out of his way to pick high-traffic locations to drop the bags. In one instance, Fotis can be seen in video propping up what would turn out to be a WeatherTech cargo liner sized for a Chevy Suburban against a building, while Traconis leaned out of the door of the truck and slipped something white and rectangular through the grate of a storm drain at the curb. Police and investigators swarmed into Hartford, and with the help of local police, they were able to recover the contents of the trash receptacles and fish out what had been dropped into the storm drain. 
What they found under the grate was an old FedEx mailing envelope containing two old, out-of-date license plates whose numbers had been modified. Those two license plates had once been registered to Fotis Dulos. Trash bags were recovered across the area, and what investigators found within them was horrific evidence. Bloody rags, cleaning items, zip ties, and finally, pieces of women's clothing, bloody, torn, and cut. And at least in one bag, rubber gloves were found, bloody on the outside, and with every chance that someone's DNA could be on the inside. It was all sent off for testing at the state's police laboratories. They would come back with confirmation that the blood was from Jennifer Dulos. There was no sign of Jennifer, though. No corpse had been found and no murder weapon either. If Fotis and Traconis had been disposing of evidence in the disappearance and probable murder of Jennifer Dulos, then what were they to make of the alibi for most of the day that Fotis had based on where his phone was? Once again, surveillance footage from security cams provided the answer. Investigators watched hours of footage offered up by Jennifer's neighbors, and they saw what might have been the explanation. Videos showed that around 8.05 a.m., Jennifer could be seen driving her Suburban into the driveway of her home, returning from dropping off the kids at school. She would not leave again until 10.25 a.m., but the driver could not be seen. This would have been far past the time she would have needed to leave to make her doctor's appointment in New York. At 10.29 a.m., the Suburban was seen heading southbound on Weed Street, leaving the area and apparently heading to a park where the vehicle would eventually be found abandoned. At 10.38 a.m., Jennifer's phone rings one last time from a spot near 200 Lapham Road in New Canaan. At 11.09 a.m., her phone completely leaves the Verizon network. At 11.12 a.m., Fotis is seen on camera driving down Merritt Parkway, leaving the area where the Suburban would be found. He is seen driving an older Toyota Tacoma pickup truck, one owned by an employee of his company, Powell Guminade. That truck, now that they know to look for it, had been seen driving into and out of the area of Jennifer's home on three occasions, and on three occasions would be seen pulling into Fotis's driveway that morning. Is that vehicle turning into the driveway for Jefferson Crossing? Yes, that vehicle is turning the driveway for Jefferson Crossing. Okay, is this the, vi the video clip you sent to the police? That's one of them. I'm going to stop it there briefly, sir. Um, is this the video that you sent to the police as That's, well? That is one of them, yes. And why did you send this clip? Well, as I, I said before, um, what we knew on the... I'm going to hit play. In July, what we knew, based on the media reports, it was different. Objection. The fact that there were these reports is one thing, but now it's getting to the what he learned in the media. Well, the question was essentially, what's the reason you sent these videos to the police? Based upon that interaction I had with Fotis on the 26th, based upon the fact um, of what we had learned from the media at that point in time, the visits to North End, I had two cars leaving in tandem, which was not consistent with normal vehicle movement patterns. And you've lived at that residence for how many years at that point? Nine years. Now, you indicated you were familiar with the vehicles and the vehicle patterns? Yes. Um, do you recognize this vehicle, the red truck? Yeah, that, that's Pavel's truck. And what about the vehicle behind it? Well, that vehicle is a, uh, that's a GMC Yukon XL. Um, that was a rental. A neighbor of Fotis's would notice something on his own security camera recordings that seemed terribly out of place. On that day, on three occasions, smoke came from different chimneys at Fotis's house. Temperatures that day were very spring-like, in the mid-50s to low-60s with very little wind, not the kind of weather that you would have someone lighting up fireplaces for warmth. Investigators quickly matched the arrivals and departures of the Tacoma pickup truck with each of the smokestack events. Powell was quickly interrogated, and in exchange for immunity, he told them that Fotis had borrowed the old truck from him. When Fotis had returned it to Powell that afternoon, he brought it back completely cleaned, inside and out. 
He also advised Powell that he needed to sell it quick while the truck still had some value. The following day, he told Powell that he needed to make sure to change out the seats in the truck since they were so worn out. When Powell said there were no good replacement seats for the truck at any local junkyard, Fotis told him to go and remove the seats from a wrecked Porsche Cayenne that he owned and replace them with those. He needed to do so in a hurry, though, and dispose of those seats. Investigators now had plenty to go on when it came to building their case that Fotis had committed murder. A scenario emerged wherein that Fotis had entered the area on a bicycle and laid in wait for Jennifer to come home. Once she had arrived, he snuck into the garage and attacked her by surprise once the garage door was closed. He killed her and then did a thorough job of cleaning up the crime scene. He then drove the Suburban away and abandoned it at the park where he had stashed the Toyota Tacoma. Investigators had motive, opportunity, and a lot of physical evidence, but they did not have a body. The bloody clothing came back with her DNA on it, and there was no way anyone could have survived losing that much blood. She was dead, and there was no questions in their mind as to who did it. But his phone records showed that his phone had been at his house for the time in question, and the phone records showed an incoming call had been taken on it during that critical period. Investigators immediately figured that Traconis had held the phone that day and had taken the call to cover for him. Except when she was brought in for questioning, she said that she hadn't done that and that her own phone records backed up her story of taking her daughter to school and then making a couple of stops in town. On June the 1st of 2019, Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis were arrested and charged with tampering with or fabricating physical evidence in connection with the case. Both pled not guilty and made bail. The investigation and the search for Jennifer's body continued. Two men walking the property of a private hunting and fishing club in Connecticut one cold spring day came across something completely out of place. They would later tell police they had found a trench dug in an out-of-the-way place on the tract of land that was about six feet long, two feet wide, and three feet deep, covered with a set of grill grates. Inside the trench was a blue tarp and two large, unopened bags of lime. Later that month, one of the two men who had come across the trench had begun wondering what they had stumbled across and did it have a connection with the disappearance of that woman in New Canaan. They went back to the spot, but this time found that it had been filled in and covered over with leaves and brush for concealment. He immediately contacted the authorities. Teams carefully uncovered the spot, but found no corpse within. The man also told them that he had been told that one of the founders of the club, a former member, had been asking about getting access to the property just before the trench had been found. The man, he said, had been given a key to the property, but had given up seeking membership not long after the woman's disappearance. The man, he told them, was Kent Mawinney, a local attorney, one who had been a longtime friend and business associate of Fotis Dulos. On August the 13th, Michelle Traconis was brought back in and interviewed. During the interrogation of Traconis, they found that she admitted to seeing Mawinney in the four groups' office within the home that day, and that he had apparently taken a call from an old friend of Fotis's from back home in Greece. She said she didn't know much more about it than that, though. Investigators realized there was a scenario wherein Mawinney had held the phone at the residence that morning while Traconis went out, providing not just an electronic alibi for Fotis, but also reinforcing it by taking an international call from Fotis's friend. Had the men not come to police about the found trench and the story mentioning Mawinney's name, no one could have reasonably placed him at the Fotis home on that day. They had found the linchpin that would pull the plot completely apart. On January 7, 2020, police moved out and served arrest warrants on Fotis Dulos, Michelle Traconis, and Kent Mawinney. Fotis would be charged with murder, while Traconis and Mawinney would face conspiracy to commit murder charges. All three would be charged with destruction of evidence. Bond for Fotis was set at $6 million, and he was released later that day. He was scheduled to return to court on February the 28th of 2020. 
Traconis would also post bail with a return date of August the 6th, 2020. Mawini would make bail in October of 2020. On February 28th, Fotis Doulos' new girlfriend, Anna Curry, showed up at court and told Fotis' lawyers that he would be following along in a few minutes. Time went by, and Fotis never arrived. With court looming, his attorneys attempted to call him, but to no avail. Officers were dispatched to his home to find out what had happened. They came across him, sitting asphyxiated in the passenger seat of his car inside the home's garage. Officers immediately dragged him outside and began performing life-saving measures on him as the ambulance arrived on the scene. Inside the car, a note would be found that read, I refuse to spend even an hour in jail for something I had nothing to do with. There had been talk that on his court date, bail could have been rescinded, sending him back to jail to await trial. Fotis would be airlifted to a nearby hospital and then on to one that had a higher level of trauma care. He would die two days later. At the time of his death, he had been facing bankruptcy with nearly $7 million in debt and had been trying to sell the home he had built and was living in. The main suspect in the disappearance and the assumed murder of Jennifer Dulos could no longer stand trial. It would be four years, almost to the day, that Michelle Traconis would see her own case come to trial and stand for her part in the conspiracy. Over 27 days of testimony, prosecutors showed the video evidence of Traconis and Fotis disposing of the trash bags in Hartford. They even showed footage of an apparently homeless man sorting through one of the trash bags before the police arrived. The homeless man, when later interviewed, said that he found two small pillows in the trash, but put them back because they were covered with blood. Two camping pillows had been identified as missing from Jennifer's garage. Prosecutors then brought out the items found within the trash bags retrieved from around town, items they would prove to not just belong to Jennifer, but were also covered in her blood and sometimes the DNA of Fotis Dulos as well. Sergeant Duggan, is this the item that you uh, pulled out of the garbage of Albany and Green on May 30th, 2019? It is. Now, with respect to, first of all, what is it? That's a bra. The back of the bra is clasped. Is, was it like that in the condition when you found it? That's exactly how we found it. And with respect to the front of the bra, is there a cut going down the middle of it? There is. Approximately where, please? Uh, right, right in the center <coughs> of the bra. Just a... Sorry, I'm just If you can, sir, if you could point out. And would that be a little off center on the left side? the left breast area? Yes. Thank you. Sir, if you could take a look at the screen behind you. Is that a photograph of the shirt that you took out of the garbage on um, May 30th, 2019? It is. Is that the back or the front? I believe that's the back. The... If, do you wish to say, you can continue. The front was cut. The front was cut. Can you show the next picture, please. Thank you. So is that the front? That is. Okay. I'm going to show you. If I may, sir, can you please point to where the front shirt is cut? It's it's almost right down the center of the shirt. Are there any buttons or zippers on the shirt? No. Sir, do you recognize this item? I do. What is it? That's exhibit number uh, 502A. That's the, what was a clear poncho with blood-like substance. It was a clear poncho? Yes. So with respect to the uh, poncho that I'm holding, uh, up here, on, I don't know if you can see it, sir, but on the top, it looks like there are cuts. Yes. Was that in that condition when you seized it that day? Yes. I 
and there are, I guess, numerous markings and things on this. Uh, do you know what that is? No. Do you know where, which part it was from? No, when we took it out, it was, a lot of it was wet, so it was just leaking everywhere. In effect, because Fotis could not stand for trial, to prove Traconis was involved in conspiracy to commit murder, prosecutors had to make a strong case that Jennifer had been murdered, that Fotis had in fact killed her, and that Traconis had worked in conjunction with Fotis to plan it out and cover up the murder. Numerous witnesses were brought in to testify about the relationship Traconis had not just with Fotis, but with his children, and how her relationship with the man's ex-wife was. They painted a picture of a woman, a mother herself, fiercely loyal to her man and angry about how he was being treated in the custody battle. Those would pale in comparison, however, to the strength of one piece of evidence secured, not from Jennifer's home, but from the home shared by Fotis and Traconis, written scripts the two had made to keep their story straight. Within, the two had worked out the details not of the murder plot, but instead of how their alibis would be structured and how they could cover for one another. If one was supposed to be somewhere at a specific time, the other would be able to verify it. And, in all the initial questioning, they held to those scripts almost verbatim. In the end, after closing arguments were made, after Michelle Traconis declined to take the stand in her own defense, the jury came back from their deliberations on Friday, March the 1st, 2024, and delivered a judgment of guilty on all counts. Sentencing will follow later, as will the trial of Kent Mawinney. It is cold comfort that the murder of Jennifer Dulos has been solved. Her five children are now living with their grandmother, and they will carry a heavy, heavy burden they never asked for for the rest of their lives. If you found this case compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.